Thank you so much, my dear brother. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Habibi ilahi al-alameen abil qasim al-mustafa muhammad. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين إمامنا وسيدنا الحجة بن الحسن المهدي أرواح العالمين له الفدا Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I sincerely extend to you my condolences on the martyrdom of Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Mujtaba Salawatullahi Alayhi. In the month of Safar, there are a number of important events that we commemorate. One of them is the martyrdom of Al-Imam Al-Hassan, the second Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to grant us his ziyarah in Jannat al-Baqiyya and also his shafa'a and to illuminate our hearts and minds with his knowledge. In our discussion tonight, we continue our biography series, and now we have reached the 11th Imam of Ahl al-Bayt, who is also Al-Imam Al-Hassan. We have two noble Imams whose names were Al-Hassan, the second Imam, Al-Hassan ibn Ali, and the 11th Imam, also Al-Hassan ibn Ali, Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari, the son of Al-Imam Ali Al-Hadi. Tonight, we will examine Briefly, the biography of the 11th Imam of Ahl al-Bayt, Al-Imam al-Askari salawatullahi alayhi, and learn about this great personality whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to lead us. Al-Imam al-Askari salawatullahi alayhi was born in the year 232 after the Hijrah. And the Imam was martyred year 260 of the Hijra. So for how long did the Imam live? 232 until 260, that's 28 years. He did not live long. At age 28, the enemies of Allah poisoned him and killed him. And this shows that the later Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they were persecuted and killed at a very young age. We've already examined before Imam Al-Jawad alayhi salam how he was the youngest imam to be killed. It seems those evil caliphs of Bani al-Abbas, they could not wait for the imams to grow older. They were so vicious, they wanted to eliminate the proof of God as soon as they had the chance. But they had a plan, and Allah has a plan, and Allah has the best of planners. And imam al-Hassan al-Askari was two years old, when he had to move from Medina to Samarra, and Imam al-Hadi in year 234 was summoned by the Abbasid Caliph. He summoned him to go to Samarra. And Samarra was basically a military base that the Abbasids has established. And they made it the seat of their government. And the reason why that happened is during the era of the Abbasids, Many Turks came, many troops who were Turks, they came to Baghdad and these people were savages. They were vicious. They would go, they would see a woman on the street, they would harass her. Anything they could get their hands on, they would confiscate it. So the people of Baghdad went to the Abbasids and they told them, look, this is not acceptable. If your troops keep harassing us like this, we're going to rebel against you. So that's why they moved their military and political capital from Baghdad to Samarra. And so Imam Ali al-Hadi was summoned to Samarra. In our last discussion, we examined the life and the biography of Imam al-Hadi. Imam Hassan al-Askari was two years old when he went with his father to Samarra. Of course, most of the time of Imam al-Hadi was away from his family, sometimes he would be accompanied by his son, Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari. Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari, when it comes to his imamah, 
his official role of being Imam, it did not last long. That's because Al Imam Al Hadi at age, at, in the year 254, at age 240, at age 42, so year 254 after the Hijrah, at age 42, Al Imam Al Hadi was poisoned in Samarra. So now Al Imam Al Hassan Al Askari became the official Imam. His Imam only lasted six years from year 254 till year 260. Only during these six years that he was an actively an Imam. So he was 22 years old when his father was killed and he became the Imam. From 22 to 28 is the duration of his Imam. Al-Imam al-Askari played a major role in preparing for the occultation and the ghayba of the last imam and leaving a setup for the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, for the Shia to know right from wrong and to know their religion and their belief system and their legal system during the time of the ghayba. And Imam al Askari was very instrumental in that. Now, who's the mother of Imam al Askari? The mother of Imam al Askari was a very noble and decent woman by the name of Hudayf. That's one of her names. Another title she had is Sousan. Another title that she had is Sulayl. She was a very noble lady from Northern Africa. You see the later Imams of Ahlul Bayt marrying these righteous women from Africa to demonstrate to their society that racism has no place in the religion of Islam. And that if a person is righteous, even if they come from a different race, we make them part of our own families. So the mother of Imam al Askari was a very noble and decent woman. Her name was Sayyida Hudayf. In fact, we have narrations that Imam al Askari had asked his mother, Lady Hudayf, to take care of the young Mahdi after he was born. So, year 259. One year before Al Imam al Askari was martyred, he asked his mother to take the young four year old Mahdi at this time because Imam Mahdi was born year 255 after the Hijrah. That's one year after the Imama of Al Imam al Hassan. He told his mother, Take the young Mahdi and go to Hajj. Learn the way, be aware of the dangers because after me, you will be taking care of him. And so she took the young Mahdi to the Hajj. And after Al Imam al Askari was martyred, she also took the young Mahdi to the Hajj to leave Samarra for a while because the enemies were actively seeking this young boy, the Mahdi, to kill him. So for a long time, Lady Hudayf, the mother of Al Imam al Askari, she acted as the liaison, the representative of Al Imam al Mahdi. Sometimes when Shia had questions, or they were stuck in a situation, they would come to Lady Hudayf. And they would ask her questions. She was a representative of Imam al-Mahdi, her own grandson. Imagine the position Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given her. That is truly a great honor. So Lady Hudayf is the mother of Imam al-Askari. Imam al-Askari, early on when he was a young boy, he was known for his love of God, the fear of the day of judgment, and how seriously he took his religion. As Shablanji narrates this incident, he says one day Bahlul or Bahlul, he passed by a group of kids. They had toys, they were playing, they were happy. He noticed one of those boys, one of those kids, he was sad. It's as if he was crying. So he approached him and he told him, what's the matter? Why are you crying? Is it because you lack something? Do you want toys? Tell me, I'll make it available for you. He said, no, I'm not crying because of toys. You think God created me to play? And then he cited a verse in the Holy Quran that Allah created this whole universe. With purpose, don't think that there's no purpose. I have a purpose and my purpose is to worship God. And just now I remembered the day of judgment. And the, the image of the day of judgment 
is what makes me sad at this point. Bahlul was shocked. Who is this young kid who can speak with this type of ideology and mentality? He asked, they told him, this is Al-Hasan ibn Ali, Al-Imam Al-Askari, the son of Al-Imam Al-Hadi. Early on, we see Al-Imam Al-Askari exhibiting these noble traits, and he was indeed very knowledgeable and very serious about his religion. Now, Al-Imam Al-Askari had four other siblings. Two of them are notable. The eldest sibling was his brother, Sayyid Muhammad. For those of you who've gone to Iraq for ziyara, may Allah grant us the ziyara soon, inshallah. And may Allah protect the visitors of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. When you go to Samarra, usually on the way to Samarra or on the way back, we stop at a village or a small town called um, Balad. It's called Balad. It's now, it's a primarily Sunni area where many Sunnis live in that area. But if you go to this town, you find that there is a shrine. The shrine of a Sayyid Muhammad. There's an actual shrine that you go and you visit. He was the eldest son of Imam al-Hadi and he was indeed a very noble man. One of the best sons of any Imam other than the infallible Imams, of course. He was truly a beacon of guidance and a beacon of hope, a scholar, a worshiper. The people of Iraq know him to be Sab'id Dujayl, you know, the lion of the Dujayl area where you have the Dijla River, the Tigris River. He was known for his courage, for standing up to the truth. And many people today, they go to his shrine, they supplicate to Allah. Allah answers them by the haq and the right and the status of a Sayyid Muhammad. In fact, if you go to the shrine, of a Sayyid Muhammad, one thing will catch your attention. You'll see a bunch of cradles over there. People come and they dedicate cradles there. And that's because many people who have fertility issues, they cannot have children. They visit Sayyid Muhammad, they make a nad, a vow, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with a progeny. I myself have been to that shrine. I've seen all those cradles and all those people leaving notes you know, thank you, Ya Allah, for blessing us with Sayyid Muhammad. Thank you, Sayyid Muhammad, for interceding on our behalf. So this Sayyid Muhammad, he is the eldest brother of Al-Imam Hassan al-Askari, salawatullahi alayhi. Now, he had another brother by the name of Ja'far. Ja'far was not a good guy, at least in the beginning. Some say he repented, some say no. Ja'far claimed to be the Imam. And we find that after the martyrdom of Imam al-Askari, he tried to invite people to follow him and to dismiss the young Mahdi. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala foiled his plots and attempts. Subhanallah, you have one family here. One of them is an Imam, Imam al-Askari. One of them is Sayyid Muhammad, an amazing person. And one of them is Ja'far. Even some you know, historians call him Ja'far al kaddam because he lied. And yeah, sometimes you can have that in one family. And usually the reason, my dear brothers and sisters, because once could say, wait, if you have your father as an imam and your mother is the best of mothers, then how could a person you know, come out this way? Sometimes you find these sons of the imams who maybe deviated, they were from different mothers. See, just like Noah. Noah was a prophet, he was infallible, but his son, was influenced by his mother. His mother was not a believer. And that just shows you the significance of choosing the right mother. Now you could ask, well, why did the Imam sometimes marry women uh, who were not believers? Well, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt had a mission. There were many reasons why they would marry these women, just like the Prophet He married a number of wives to unite the tribes, to uh, for instance, teach the Muslim community a lesson. It's a trial. So the Imams have their trials. And Imam al-Askari, salawatullahi alayhi, when he was in Samarra and after the martyrdom of his father, al-Imam al-Hadi, he went through many difficult trials. Initially, al-Mu'taz, the Abbasid Caliph who killed al-Imam al-Hadi, he tried to have al-Imam al-Askari killed at age 22. 
just after he killed the Imam Al Hadi, he said to one of his aides, Ibn Sa'id, he told him, Take Hassan al Askari to some place, on the way, kill him, and just say it's an accident. But Allah protected Al Imam al Askari. Some people were informed of this plot, so they sent a message to Al Imam al Askari telling him, Look, Al Mu'taz trying to kill you. He says, don't worry, now it's not my time. I have a mission to complete. I have a message to deliver from God and Allah will protect me now. Don't worry, Allah is with me. My time's not up yet. And indeed, Allah protected him and those evil ones died. And Mu'taz, soon after that, he died. Allah got rid of him. He thought he would kill two Imams of Ahlul Bayt. No, Allah did not extend his life for him to do that. And Allah eliminated Al Mu'taz. A number of other Caliphs came to power. The last of them was Al Mu'tamid. And Al Mu'tamid, he was the one who killed Al Imam Al Askari. He was indeed an evil Caliph. Now, Al Imam Al Askari, when he was in Samarra, he was basically put under house arrest. So people did not have access to him. Many followers of the Imam would come desperately trying to meet him and see him, but they did not have access to the Imam salam. And this was a very difficult trial. Now, twice a week, the Caliph would force an Imam al-Askari to go to his palace on Mondays and Thursdays to give the impression to the Muslim world that he's taking care of an Imam al-Askari, he's not under house arrest, see, he's my guest in the palace. You see these evil ways? that those caliphs would use. So the Shia, what would they do initially? When Imam al-Askari is leaving from you know, his house, going to the palace, the guards are taking him. They would say salam to him on the street, on the way to the palace, on the way back from the palace. They would ask him a few questions and be in touch with him. Until the Abbasids were becoming very sensitive and they threatened anyone who would come and talk to Imam al-Askari, they would persecute them. So Imam al-Askari wrote a letter to his Shia, to his followers. He told them, look, you are putting yourselves in danger. Next time when they take me to the palace, no one says salam to me. No one comes close to me because they will persecute you. Allahu Akbar. How miserable is this? How heavy is it on our hearts to hear that the Imam was living there? But his Shia could not even come to say salam to him because of those evil Abbasid rulers who were so jealous of the Imams, they could not stand the truth that they represented. And Imam al Askari went through a lot of difficulty in Samarra. Sometimes, you know, they would imprison him. They would imprison him. He was under house arrest, but they, sometimes they would take him to an actual prison. Once the Abbasid Caliph he told one of his aides, I want you to go after Al Hassan and imprison him and torture him. So he took him to the prison, the dungeon, and he assigned two vicious, rough men to administer the torturing of Al Imam al Askari. A while after, they realized that these two men who are supposed to torture Al Imam al Askari, they're praying with him. So they were summoned by the government. The government told them, Look, we assigned you to torture Al Askari. What are you doing? You're praying with him? They said, Look, don't blame us. We never saw anything bad from this man. During the day, he's fasting. At night, he's supplicating and praying. And basically, his prayer mesmerized us. He showed us spirituality. Now we, sure, we worship Allah like he does. We're not going to torture him. SubhanAllah, they were enemies of the Imam. They were summoned to torture the Imam. But they became supporters of Imam al-Askari. They became followers of Imam al-Askari when they saw how he supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they saw his spirituality, when they saw his ibadah and his worship. These are the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Even when you put them in a dungeon, they teach others. They are a source of guidance. They don't give up. They're firmly connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
During the era of Imam al-Askari in Samarra, a number of ideological challenges faced the Muslim Ummah. One of the challenges was that a philosopher by the name of Ishaq al-Kindi or Ibn Ishaq al-Kindi or Abu al-Ishaq al-Kindi. There are different reports about his name. Let's just say Ishaq al-Kindi for now. He was a philosopher in Iraq and he wrote a book called The Contradictions of the Quran. And basically he gathered verses which he thought were contradictory and he wrote a book about it. Now some people starting, started to have doubts. And Imam al-Askari told some of his students, why don't you go and debate him? Before he you know, publishes this book basically or circulates it, go and debate him, he's wrong. You know, some of the arguments that he would bring up is for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one verse states that God created you and that which you do. God created you and your action. And then in other verses, Allah says that you're responsible for your action. So is this, is this a contradiction? Which is it? Does God create my action according this, to this verse? Or I am solely responsible for my action. Now, of course, the one who's ignorant and he looks at the surface of the Quran, he may think that there's a contradiction in the Quran. But once you examine the Quran deeper with analysis, with critical thinking, you find no, there is no contradiction in the Holy Quran. Absolutely not. One day a man came to Imam Ali and he told him this book of Quran has contradictions because in one verse says, God takes your soul. Allahu anfusahina mota. In another verse, it says the angel of death, he takes our souls. Yet in a third verse, it says the angels, the messengers take your soul. Tawafathum Rusuluna or the Malaika. You know, they take the lives of the people. So which is it? He's telling him Ali. Is it God? Is it the angel of death? Is it other angels? The Imam told him, you've got it wrong. There is no contradiction. Allah ultimately is in charge. So yes, ultimately he takes the souls. But Allah has aids. The angel of death works under God. On behalf of God, he takes the souls. And the angel of death has a number of messengers that work for him as well. You know, sometimes there's an explosion, maybe a hundred People can die instantaneously. While the angel of death has angels with him, they take the soul. So there is no contradiction. It's just like uh, when a country goes to war. If you said the following statement, you know, Mr. President, he went to war. Or you can say ex-official in the Pentagon, he went to war. Or you could say the troops went to war. Is that a contradiction? No. No. When you say the president went to war, that means he's authorized it. He's in charge. When you say the soldiers went to war, that means they're there on the ground. So Imam Ali Ali Salam told that guy, no, there is no contradiction in the Quran. Understand it. Same with this verse. Yes, there is a verse that says Allah has created us and what we made. But you have to look at the tafsir of this verse. One tafsir is that the idols, those pagans, would make the idols. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, they're created, these idols. How do you worship them? Another meaning is, okay, you people, you have actions. You're the ones who do and work and act. But who gave you the power? When you work, when you act, you do so through your mental capacity, through your eyes, through your hands, through your brain, when you think and make a decision. Well, who gave you those powers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't it so? So technically, yes, Allah created you and your actions because he enabled you to have free will and to act as you wish. This is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not a robot. Allah could have made you a robot. Many things in the universe, basically Allah runs them. Look at the atoms, the subatomic particles. Look at the plants, the trees, the solar system, everything. Allah has decided their fate for them. Well, you could have been like that. The Quran says, no, Allah created you and your actions. You have free will, sure. But remember, Allah enabled you. So don't forget that. In any case, this Al-Kindi, he claimed there were contradictions in the Quran. So Imam Al-Askari sent one of his students to debate him. 
This student of an Imam al-Askari went to that man and he told him, look, how do you claim that you know everything in the Quran for you to make such a claim that there are contradictions in the Quran? Isn't it possible, theoretically, that when Allah revealed these verses, he means something else and you misunderstood it? Isn't it possible? He says, yeah, I mean, it's possible. He says, if it's possible, then how do you claim there's a contradiction? Maybe you didn't understand the Quran. Maybe it has a different layer. Maybe it has a deeper meaning. Maybe it has another tafsir. You can say there's a contradiction when you know what the author has said 100%. Then you can say this is a contradiction. Do you know exactly what Allah has said in these verses? You don't. He said, you know what? You're right. I don't. That's a very valid objection. But who taught you this answer? Tell me. He said, Al-Imam Al-Hasan salam. He says, yes, only an Imam like Al-Imam Al-Hasan knows how to give us proofs like that. So you know what he did to his book? He burned it. He took that book, which was entitled The Contradictions of the Quran, and he burned it because Al-Imam Al-Askari showed him the path. And subhanAllah. The more you contemplate the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, the more you discover jewels, treasures, diamonds, and precious content in the whole Quran, precious realities. They say one day there was a professor, he was kind of hostile to Islam. He asked his class, is anyone here a Muslim? So one young man raised his hand in college. He said, yes, I am Muslim. He told him, do you believe the Quran is the actual word of God and that every word is accurate? He said, yes, we Muslims all believe that. He said, well, I have an objection. There's a verse in Surah Al-Ahzab in which the Quran says, Ma min fi Allah has not put two hearts inside a man. Rajul. <laughs> so the professor, he says, this is not an accurate verse. He tells him why. He says, why did the Quran say rajul, man? Why? Is it hinting that women can have more than one heart? The Quran should have said, you know, God did not put two hearts in a human. But why single out a man? So the young man was thinking, he wanted to see how to answer when he felt inspired. Now, this is not the actual tafsir or the story of the verse, but he felt inspired. He told him, yes, the words of God are very, very accurate. He tells him why. He tells him, because a woman can have two hearts. <laughs> he said, how? You Muslims believe a woman can have two hearts? He says, no, not us Muslims. Biology shows us that. He says, how? He says, when a woman's pregnant, she can have a fetus in her womb that has a heart. So there are two or more hearts in her. She has twins. Now we have three hearts inside of her. But that's not applicable to a man. So see, the Quran is very accurate. The, the professor was dumbfounded. He did not know how to answer this one. The more you contemplate the Quran, the more you discover its treasures. So we find that different people at the time, they had objections to the Quran and Islam. And Imam al-Askari really saved Islam by countering their arguments with sound arguments. Here's another challenge that happened at the time of Imam al-Askari. This evil Khalifa al-Mu'tamid, he had an Imam al-Askari basically imprisoned. They took him out of his house and they put him in prison. Then there was a severe drought that struck the area. So, you know, the Muslim says, they said, let's go out to the desert. Let's supplicate to Allah and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send down the rain on us. Well, the rain didn't come down. Then a group of Christians, you know, led by their scholar at Jathaliq, and there were monks amongst them. It was their turn now to ask for rain. One of the monks, the minute he put his hand under the sky, it started raining. Now the Muslims were confused. The Christians at the time, they said, see, the truth is with us. Allah sent the rain when we prayed. But when you Muslims prayed, God did not send down the rain. Now, some of the Muslims, they were actually weakened in their faith and they considered converting. So they told the Khalifa, look, you're the Khalifa of the Muslimin and you've got a crisis. You have to solve it. The faith of the Muslims has become shaky out of, because of this incident. 
So he told his aides, the only one who can save us is Al-Imam Al-Askari, is Al-Hasan ibn Ali. Go to him and tell him, save the nation, the ummah of your grandfather, Rasulullah. Subhanallah, now you remember that his grandfather is Rasulullah because of your seat, because of your power. How come you did not remember that his grandfather is Rasulullah when you imprisoned him and you ordered for him to be tortured? Now you remember. How vicious, how vicious were these enemies of Ahlul Bayt? So they go to Al Imam al Askari. He says, okay, I'll, I have a solution for this. Tell the Muslims to gather in the desert, tell the Christians to come again, and let's redo this. So they come out. Then the Christians, they say, okay, let's do dua, and you'll see how the clouds gather. As soon as they raised their hand, and that particular monk, he raised his hand under the sky, the cloud started to form. And everyone was seeing this. History has documented this. At that point, Al-Imam Al-Askari, he says to his aides, you see that particular monk? Grab his hand and open it. Let's see what he's carrying. So they open the hand of that monk. They see a bone. Al-Imam Al-Askari says to the people there, this is the bone of a prophet. You have found the bone of a prophet who's passed away many years before that, thousands of years. And when a bone of the prophet is exposed under the sky, it is the law of God to send down the rain. So he's not sending down the rain because of you and because you're on the hat. It's because of the bone of that prophet. Because this prophet died unjustly. And so whenever his bone is exposed under the sky, the sky rains. Take out the bone, now pray. He started to pray, nothing happened. Then the Imam al-Askari says, now without the bone, I will pray to Allah. And he prayed to Allah and Allah sent the rain. And this demonstrated to the Muslims that no, that those guys were not on the truth. And indeed, the Imam al-Hasan salam he was on the truth. So we find that when there was a crisis in the Muslim ummah, even though the Imam al-Askari was in prison, but he was always step up to the plate, take the initiative, and he would save those people. The Imam alayhi salam, my dear brothers and sisters, during those years, even though he was under house arrest, but he kept in touch with the Shia. And the Imam had representatives whom he had assigned to be leaders for the Shia. And the Imam was preparing the Shia for the Ghayba because during the Ghayba we don't have direct access to the Imam. So how do we get our religious teachings from scholars? And Imam al-Askari trained the Shia to follow pious scholars. Now today we may call them maraji, mujtahids, ayatullahs. We have different terms for that, but basically trustworthy scholars. One of the representatives of Imam al-Askari was Uthman, and his name was Uthman, and he was known by Al-Amri. Al-Amri, Uthman ibn Sa'id Al-Amri was a very respected person. Him and his son, the two Amris, the Imams had so much trust in them, to the point that an Imam Al-Askari once said, Al-Amri yuwabnuhu thiqatan. فَمَا أَدَّيَا إِلَيْكَ عَنِّي فَعَنِّي يُؤَدِّيَانِ Al-Amri and his son, I trust them. Whenever they do something, they do so on my behalf. So listen to them, obey them. And they were scholars. If people had questions from an Imam al-Askari, they would write a letter to the Imam. And Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, he was the one who would forward the letter to an Imam al-Askari. So they established this system where pious scholars actually guide the people. And this was a beautiful system. And one of the most famous hadiths of Imam al-Askari about following scholars is the hadith in which the Imam السلام, states, فَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ If you see a faqih, one who has the full understanding of our legal system, of our religion, you see a scholar, he's pious. He resists his own desires and temptations. He obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
the layman should follow him. They can follow him. If you're not an expert, then you follow an expert. But that expert must be trustworthy. The Imam says, don't just follow any scholar. Follow a scholar who's trustworthy. Those whom you can trust their religion and trust their faith. Test them, try them. So we find that Imam al-Askari was preparing the Ummah for the Ghaibah by basically setting the parameters for who a scholar is and who is the true scholar who is to be followed. So this is a beautiful hadith that we have that is attributed to Imam al-Askari. So we find that the Imam really prepared the grounds for the ghaybah. And he empowered those righteous scholars by teaching them to lead. One of the scholars who Imam al-Hasan al-Askari was in touch with was, was Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Babuway. Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Babuway is the father of Shaykh al-Saduq, if you've heard of a Shaykh al-Saduq. He lived in Qom. And Imam al-Askari sometimes would send, him, would send him a letter. In one of those letters, it's a heartbreaking letter. In one of those letters, an Imam al-Askari tells him, you have to be patient. The ghaybah is coming soon. You have to be patient. You have to wait for the faraj. For the best action of this ummah, faraj. the best action of my ummah is to wait for the relief for the faraj. If these days, my dear brothers and sisters, you are waiting for the imam of your time with akhlaq, with piety, with good deeds, that is the best thing that you're doing. You're waiting genuinely for the imam of your time. You tell your imam, I am a servant. I'm a soldier. Through my akhlaq, I'm your soldier. Through my good deeds, honesty, integrity, services, charity, I am your soldier. That is the best deed that you can do. So Imam al-Askari sends him a letter. He tells him, wait for the faraj. Then in that letter, he says, then give my salam to the Shia, to my followers. Give them my salam. It's as if the Imam was telling him, I'm soon departing. Difficult years, centuries lie ahead of you. You have to be patient until my son, the Mahdi, is going to reappear. Now, inshallah, later when we talk about Imam al-Mahdi, We'll talk about the circumstances of his birth and how he was born in Samarra. So we'll defer that to the uh, discussion on an Imam al-Mahdi. So an Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, he was in touch with these top scholars and the Imam alayhi salam would give them guidance. Here's one interesting incident that happened with one of, with one of the scholars of Qom. His name was Ahmed ibn Ishaq. There was a man in Qom from the progeny of an Imam al-Sadiq one of the Shia, he was known to openly commit sins and drink. So one day he went to Ahmad ibn Ishaq, who was a scholar. He was like a marja in Qom. He went to him seeking you know, some help, seeking, asking for some help. Ahmad ibn Ishaq, he kicked him out. He basically told him, I, will, I refuse to help you or meet you. You're a sinful person. Later on, Ahmed ibn Ishaq went to the Hajj. And then after the Hajj, he went to Samarra to meet Imam al-Askari. Remember, he's like a marja. He's a top scholar from Qum. When he went to the door of Imam al-Askari to seek permission to enter, Imam al-Askari did not give him permission. He was heartbroken. Why? Later, the Imam gave him permission. He told him, Ahmed. Do you know why I did not give you permission? He says, what have I done, Ibn Rasulullah? He told him, what of my Shia? What of our followers? Yes, he may be sinful, but he came to you and you kicked him out. You've not given him, given him any hope? No, this is not what, not what I expect from you. Especially since that man, he's from the descendants of my grandfather, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi Encourage him to repent. Embrace him. Don't judge him and kick him out. Ahmed ibn Ishaq was shocked. He was moved. 
He says, I apologize, my imam. I promise I'll never do that. He hurries back to Qom. He goes to that man, that sinful man. He tells him, I'm your servant. Anything I'll do for you, let me know. What do you need help with? He told him, how come you changed? You kicked me out last time. How come now you're willing to help me? He said, well, your master and my master, Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, he rebuked me. He told me, why did you do that to him? He loves us, the Ahlul Bayt. Why did you kick him out? That man said, Imam al-Askari said this about me. He told you to embrace me. He said, yes. He says, I swear by Allah, from now I'm going to change. And I repent. And subhanAllah, he became one of the righteous people of his time. This lesson is very valuable to us, my dear brothers and sisters. You know why? Sometimes we judge people. Maybe people have an appearance that doesn't look that religious. Or they've committed a mistake and we push them away. Don't do that. Sometimes when you push someone away, they go to the extreme. They lose hope. Don't make anyone lose hope. Anyone who asks you for help, who comes to you for support, try supporting them. Even if that person has made a big mistake, even if that person is sinful, tell them it's okay. I'll help you repent. Show them the path of repentance. So this is a beautiful lesson that we learned from Imam al-Haskari. And one of the beautiful hadiths of Imam al-Haskari is the famous one that says, The Imam gave us signs of the believers. Do you want to be one of the believers? The Imam says they have five main signs. Number one, التخطم باليمين. They wear the ring in the right hand. Now after, you know, the battle of Safin and Muawiyah and the whole arbitration issue, the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt, they had this tradition of wearing the ring in the left hand. So the Imam says our followers wear the ring in the right hand. So my dear brothers and sisters, if you're wearing a ring, wear it in the right. The Imam says, this is one of the alamat, one of the signs of the mu'min. Number two, al jabin. The believers, when they prostrate, they don't prostrate on the carpet. No, on the dust, on the ground. And that's why we, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, we carry that oros or torba or prayer tablet. Why? Because we want to pray on the dust just like Rasulullah would do. The mosque of the Prophet was not carpeted. It was dust. You would pray on the ground. That's number two. Number three, to pray the nawafid. To pray 51 like as a day. 17 are the mandatory ones. And 34 are the nawafid, the extra prayers. 11 of them is salat al -Layl. And then we have the nawafid of the days and the night. You know, eight rak'ah before Dhuhr, eight rak'ah before Asr, four rak'ahs after Maghrib, two rak'ahs while sitting after Asha, two rak'ahs for the morning prayer. You add them up, 17 wajib, double that, 34 mustahab, we have 51. I know you're probably busy, you can't bring yourself to pray this every day. My dear brothers and sisters, let's pray this once a month. Once a month, pray with 51 rak'ahs. The wajibat and the nawafil at least have that sign of Iman. Number four, الرحيم, In your prayer, when you say the Bismillah, don't say it silently, say it loudly. And number five, That is one of the signs of the Mu'mineen. We ask Allah to give us the tawfiq to go for the ziyara of Imam Hussein salam for the Arba'een. Now some scholars have said maybe ziyarat al-Arba'een means visiting 40 believers, but most scholars believe, no, this is a reference to the Arba'een of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. May Allah grant us that honor. So Imam al-Hassan was a source of guidance for everyone during that time. And I tell you, Imam al-Hassan, especially during those final days in Samarra, he was so persecuted. The Imam really went through difficulties. At one point when he was under house arrest, all the imam would eat is two loaves of bread and water. Imagine going on for months and months and months with two loaves of bread. What would happen to you? That took a toll on his health, on his body. But the imam salam, never gave up. The imam salam, was firm. And he was steadfast on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Samarra, in the Mu'askar, 
in the army base. And that's why we call him Imam al-Hassan al-Askari because he lived his life under house arrest in an army base, in a military base. He was not even in his own hometown with his family, with his relatives. The Imam was in isolation for all those years and he had to go through so much persecution. But the Imam السلام, prepared the Ummah for the Mahdi. Now finally Al-Mu'tamid, he decided to poison Al-Imam Al-Askari. Abu Al-Adyan, one of the companions of Al-Imam Al-Askari, he says normally Al-Imam Al-Askari would send letters with me to other cities. One day he told me Abu Al-Adyan, he was ill. Al-Imam Al-Askari had been poisoned and he was now ill. He gives me letters and he tells me, go to Madain. 15 laters, you'll come back and you will hear that I have been, basically I have died, I have passed away. So he says, okay, when I come and, I, and you have passed away, who's the Imam after you? He told him, I'll give you signs. My son will be the Imam and I'll tell you the signs. First of all, he will pray on my body. No one else. Number two, those who bring him money, like Amana, Zakat, Khums, he knows how much money it's, there is in that bag of money. And number three, he'll ask you about these letters. Abu Adyan says, after 15 days, from Madain, I came to Samarra, and I heard people crying. The friends of Imam al-Askari were crying. They said that al-Askari has been killed. Al-Askari has died. So I came, I attended the funeral. I saw the body of my beloved Imam. And you could see the signs of poison. La ilaha illallah. At age 28, imagine how young the Imam was. Young Mahdi was now five years old at this time. So now they're about to pray when Ja'far, the brother of Imam al-Askari, the uncle of Imam Mahdi, remember Ja'far al-Kadhab, the one who lied? He comes, he says, no, I am the next Imam. I'm going to pray. Those who were present there, they say a young boy at the age of five, he came, he told him, my uncle, move out of the way. I am the one who is to pray. I have a greater right to it, not you. He just naturally moved because the Imams have this glory around them. He moved, the young boy prayed. He's like, that's one sign. The second sign is that he told me, bring me these letters that you have, O Abu Al-Adyan. The third sign, a group of people came from Qom, they had money. So they said that the Imam told us when we come next, if we want to know who the next Imam is, he will know how much money we're carrying. Now Ja'far the liar, he said, you know, do you expect me to have like knowledge of the Amsin? I don't know how much money you're carrying, but give it to me. I'm the Imam. They said, no, not so fast. Then Al-Imam Al-Mahdi sent one of his aides, representatives. He went, he told them, you are carrying 1,000 dinars and 10 special dinars. So 1,010. They said, yes, how did you know? He told them, you're young Imam. He's the one who sent me. They said, yes, that's a sign. He is the Imam. So Abu Al-Adyan says, now I know who the next Imam was. So my dear brothers and sisters, in year 60 after the Hijrah, when Imam Al-Mahdi was only five, Al-Imam Al-Haskari, Askari Salawatullahi Alayhi, was poisoned, martyred, and he was buried in Samarra, in his own house, next to the body of his father, Al-Imam Al-Hadi Alayhi salam. We ask Allah to illuminate our hearts and minds with the knowledge, with the light and the nur of Imam al-Askari. And we ask Allah to grant us his ziyara to go to Samarra and to also grant us his shafa. My dear brothers and sisters, I don't know how much time we have left, but if there are any questions, uh, I am open to addressing them, inshallah. Thank you so much for that beautiful lecture, Sayyid. We do have a question regarding the Imams. Is it possible for Imams to reach higher levels than other Imams? Now, when it comes to the Imams being a source of guidance and delivering the message of Allah, they're all, they're all equal, just like the prophets and messengers. 
As the Quran says, لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله. All prophets of God are equal when it comes to delivering the message of God and they fulfill their mission. Now, when it comes to personal virtues and qualities, yes, some prophets are higher in rank than other prophets. For instance, Prophet Muhammad is the best of all prophets. He ranks higher than all prophets. Then you have Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Nuh, Prophet Musa, Isa, these all al azm they stand out. They have a higher status than other prophets. We have a similar situation with the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. They're equal in terms of their representation of God and their delivery of God's message. But if you look at the personal virtues and qualities, yes. Imam Ali السلام, ranks the highest. Then an Imam al Hassan al Mujtaba. Then al Imam al Hussein السلام, Then a narration says Imam al Mahdi comes after al Imam al Hussein. Then after Al Imam Al Mahdi, all the other Imams are, you know, um, equally virtuous. So yes, yeah, some Imams are higher in rank than other Imams. Thank you, Sayyid. Then maybe we can do one more question. Um, what is the criteria for adding Radiallahu Anhu after someone's name? For example, can we say it after scholars? Now, linguistically and technically, you can say Radiallahu An for any person who had Iman and belief. Now, yes, they may have shortcomings. You are making a dua and you're saying, may Allah be pleased with him. That's what it means. You're just making a dua. May Allah be pleased with him. That means may Allah forgive him and accept him. Technically, you can say this to anyone, any person who you know is a believer. So you can say this for scholars. If you're, uh, you know, uh, parents, for instance, uh, passed away and they were righteous people as far as you know, you can say all those. It's, then you can also say this phrase for them as well. You know, either radiallahu anhum or radhwanullahi alayhim. May God's uh, satisfaction be given to them. That means may Allah forgive them basically. So yeah, linguistically you can say it on anyone. Now historically, culturally, usually this is used for like the Sahaba, right? Uh, the high-ranking companions or just any companion in Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnah, I believe any companion, any companion who saw the Prophet, narrated from the Prophet, lived with the Prophet, you say, radiallahu an. We disagree. We say the Quran says there are two types of companions. Minhum man yuridu dunya, the Quran says. Some of them, they wanted dunya. Wa minhum man yuridu akhirah. And some of them want the akhirah. There were good companions, and there were hypocrites, bad companions. So we in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we say that no, you cannot say radiallahu anh just to hayyallah any companion. Muawiyah was an evil companion. He disobeyed the Prophet. He stood against the Imam of his time. He killed companions. Hijr ibn Uday, he killed him. Amr ibn Hamad al Khuzai, he killed him. Many companions he unjustly killed. And I sit here and I say, radiallahu an, what, what kind of religion is this? What kind of ideology is this? So when it comes to radiallahu anh, normally you'll find Muslims using this term for the Sahaba. You know, the companions of the Prophet and, and you know, um, basically those high-ranking followers of the companions. But technically you can say it to anyone who's a mu'min. You can say that. You can say it to a scholar. You can say it to a family member who was righteous. You can say radiallahu anh. That is fine. It's okay to say it. Thank you so much, Sayyid, for your time today. I'm going to leave any other questions that uh, I think we had one or two more for next week or the following week, inshallah, we'll discuss the next date and let everyone know as always. Um, and inshallah, everyone has a blessed week. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.